Hello. Hey, this is Dr. Tech. Um, today, I just want to talk about you know how to read my notes and um, just kind of like a full treatment of you know how I wrote my notes and how it was intended to be read. So let's go ahead and start with a module that we have not uh, started on yet because you know reading ahead is kind of the key to uh, being successful in this class and also in my all of my classes. All right, so we're going to get started here. Uh, what I'm going to do, uh, this is basically a PDF that I printed, quote unquote, printed out from the HTML document. Uh, you can either read directly from the browser or you can print it on the on paper so that you can read it um, kind of you know, whenever you want to, whenever you have time to read it. You don't need the internet access if it's already on paper. It also helps to download um, the file and put it onto a computer because that way, you know, as long as you have your computer with you, then, you know, you still have access to it. So let's go ahead and start reading. Um, I'm going to turn on the, um, this is the highlighter or the marker tool. So I'm going to switch it to the highlighter and see if I can choose a faint color. No, that doesn't let me choose the grayscale, but that's okay. Because all I need to do is to kind of highlight, you know, where um, I'm talking about. All right, so we'll talk about, you know, from the beginning. Um, and it says, you know, although the set of integers has an infinite number of elements. So I'm using a mouse pointer here to kind of indicate the way I'm reading. All right, so this sentence is not too um, it's not too bad because you know I think we all know that you know there's an infinite number of integers. The way an integer value is stored in a computer has a finite bit width. Okay, so right here we have to pause a little bit because you know we have to understand what it means to be finite. Okay, you know, meaning you know there's a uh, fixed number of. Okay. So what is bit width? Okay, so I'm going to highlight you know, the term bit width over here. So uh, we already understand the word you know, bit width because that is used in Logisim. So Logisim uses you know, this particular term to decide how many bits there are in an input port, in an output port, uh, in a gate, and so on. So that is something that we have exposure to already. Um, even more importantly, I'm going to switch to my um, you know, pencil or writing instrument tool. The other question is what exactly is a bit? Okay, A bit is a binary, and that's where we get the B, digit, D-I-G-I-T, and that's where we add, get the I-T. So a bit in computer science is a binary digit. So width is basically the number of binary digits, and you know, and this entire sentence is basically saying there's a fixed number of binary digits when we store integers. So as a result of that, okay, I claim that a finite range of values can be to be, and with that, a finite range of values to be represented by the integer. Um, so the next discussion is based on module zero to eight two. Okay, so as I, let me. Use the mouse pointer here, so that means you know, you should have read module two uh, zero to eight two and fully understand that module before reading this one. So let's see what it has to say about you know that particular module. It says right here a base two number with digits zero to w minus one. So these are the digit positions. Um, Therefore, a total of W digits, W is an integer that is at least one, because it doesn't make sense to have an integer that has no digits, can represent values from zero to two to the power of W minus one. All right, so right here, um, we have a question. It's like, uh, did we talk about this, right? And if we did not talk about this explicitly, how do we know that? So that is the next question. So that means you know if you don't remember um, how a value is represented by a number um, in any base, then it's time to review that particular module. So let's go ahead and switch, okay? Because I want to replicate the experience of how the notes you know, should be 
view device. So we switch to documents, uh, CISP 310, and this is 0282. There we go. All right, so specifically what we want to do is to refer to how a value is represented. So, um, so this is all good, but I want to point to the one portion that is really important, and this is the portion. So I'm going to highlight the equation here. Oh, okay, I guess the highlight tool does not work like that. Alrighty, okay. So let me see what other tool do I have here. Uh, ink pen, marker, and I want it to be as faint as possible. There we go. Not sure whether this is going to work or not because, you know, it might. Okay, that works. Okay, cool. All right, so I'm going to highlight you know, the equation here. This is the equation that I'm talking about. Ooh, that's the, uh, this is also called a more pattern uh, because of my computer. Oh, there we go. Okay, now we cancel out the more pattern. Not so cool. All right, anyway, this is the equation that we are talking about. Um, so now you have to remember what these, um, what these letters are representing, V versus D versus B. Um, so if you read this module, hopefully you took notes that D is representing the digit um, and the subscript I is the position of the digit. So D of zero is the digit representing the quantity of ones because B is the base. So B, is B raised to the power of I, you know, which is the digit position, is what you need to put multiply to the digit value at that particular position. All right. So this is important because this tells me that I have a way to figure out, you know, how a binary number works. So now let me switch back to the other notes. Unfortunately, this tablet does not give me a very easy way. Oh, I guess, you know, recent files would work. So I can now switch back to signed versus unsigned. There we go. Okay, that is kind of cool. So now the question is, you know, um, how can I double check that this is true. How do I know that, you know, given that we have W bits, that the value that we can be represented is from zero to two to the power of W, two to the power of W minus one. Now the actual theory behind this is, I would say not very difficult, but it's a topic that, um, that really needs to use um, proof by induction, which is a concept taught in CISP 440. So I'm not expecting anyone in this class to be able to prove this particular theorem. However, um, you can do it by observation. See, so that is how, that is why you know uh, for every hour in lecture, you can easily use up to you know two hours to basically do all of these thought exercises by yourself. Okay, so I'm just going to do this part here. Okay, based on, this is only based on what I know in module 0282 and, you know, the fact that we're dealing with a binary number, which is base 2, and we have, you know, W digits, you know, going from digit 0 to digit W minus 1, W minus 1. I just want to show myself that, um, you know, for a specific example, okay, so let's go to a particular example here. So I'm going to use the highlight tool. And in the next paragraph, it says, you know, given a width of four bits, um, uh, integer values from zero to two to the power of my four, the whole thing minus one is 15, can be represented. So this is a very specific concrete example. The question is, do I know enough to do this already? All right, so let's go ahead and do this. So I'm going to a note this time so that I can actually write down something. So I'm going to write down a few things. I'm going to write down your V equals to I going from negative infinity to positive infinity D of I B to the power of I. This is copied straight out from uh, module 0 to A2, which talks about base conversion. So after this, I'm going to say, okay, since we're dealing with base two numbers, so B equals to two. And also, you know, because, you know, we are dealing with a fixed number of digits from 0 to 3, because a 4-bit number has 4 digits, the first digit is 0, 
and the last digit is three. So now I can say, okay, the value that is being represented is, okay, that's a poorly written equal sign. So let me, uh, okay, I want to fix my equal sign because it's just not nice. Uh, the erase, erase, oh, there we go, we want the selection erase tool and change that to a properly written equal sign. Now that looks good. All right, so in this case here, we are limited to zero to three because we're dealing with a four digit number starting with um, digit zero. We still don't know what uh, number we're dealing with. So uh, D of I is still a quote unquote variable, but we know what base we're dealing with already. It is in base two. So that means you know, this whole thing can be expanded to d0 times you know, 1, because 2 to the power of 0 is 1, plus d1 times 2, plus d2 times 4, plus d3 times 8. All right, so if I need to find the largest value that can be represented, as well as the smallest value that can be represented, I think that is a pretty easy thought exercise. We just make all the d0, d1, d2, d3 to be zeros to get a minimum. And then we uh, turn all of those to the largest digit value in base two, which is one, in order to find the largest value. So now we say if d0, d1, d2, and d3, okay, I'm, going to, I'm going to put my normal keyboard away so that I can use my you know, more desk space for the tablet. So this makes it easier to write. Okay, if these are all zeros, then V equals to zero. Because you, know, you end up with zero times one plus zero times two times plus zero times four plus zero times eight, and which is a zero. On the other hand, if d0 is d1, is d2, is d3, and they're all maximized to a 1, then the value being represented is going to be 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8, which in this case is, guess what, 15. Woo, okay, so now we switch back to the document that we were on, and we have just um, double-checked and verified for ourselves that um, this range is correct. So this exercise, okay, ooh, 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 ooh. okay, there we go. Uh, that is not what I intended. And I cannot unhide that. Huh. That is interesting. Can I erase? Nope. Huh. Okay, so I cannot undo highlighting. It's rather annoying. No, that is not what I want. Alrighty. I have to learn how to undo how the highlighter because the highlighter <laughs> cannot be undone. Um, that is rather annoying. Okay, let me see what options do we have here. Add keyword, erase all. Yeah, let's go ahead and erase all. Mm, yes, erase everything. And it does not erase highlighting. That is most interesting. Okay, it does make the document a little bit harder to read. Mm. All right, I'm not sure what to do to unhide the highlighting because you know this makes it kind of hard to read because the text is a little bit dark. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna try a few things here and see if I can fix this problem. Um, Yep, long press doesn't do a single thing. And what is that tool? Oh. 
There we go. So that controls uh, what I can do with highlighting. So I can actually erase highlighting now. Ooh, okay, cool. Oh, no, 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 that's not what I intended. Mm, cancel. What I intend to do is to toss it. And let's toss this last one. There we go. Okay, I knew it could be done. I just didn't know how. Yes, I did not read the manual. Okay, that is my fault. And here I am, you know, telling you guys to read the modules ahead of time. Hmm. A little bit ironic, but I take responsibility. See, you know, when I don't know how to do something, then I try to figure it out on my own. That is really kind of the key. Anyway, anyway. So you can see how I just applied something that I have learned in order to verify an observation in this module over here. But let's go ahead and read some more. Okay, so we, are we will continue to uh, process this particular module. And then it says, since the range of value for a 4-bit number is only from 0 to 15, what about 19? So the next section talks about, you know, there are two ways to look at this. You can either think about this as 19 cannot be represented as a 4-bit integer, or you can say that 19 is going to share the representation as 3, okay? And the reason why we say that is because you know, of um, congruent modular math. So congruent modular math is a uh, math concept. It is not complex in the sense that um, it is only based on division and remainder, which are concepts that we should be familiar with already since actually elementary school. So that makes it a little bit easy, but what makes it a little bit harder to understand is what does it mean exactly? What does it entail? So when we use the term um, congruent modulo, okay, let me highlight the term because it is an important term. So when we use this term congruent modulo, uh, it has a specific meaning. It means one of, you can use one of the three uh, representations down here to, um, to understand it. The first one is a notation. This is just a notation, and this notation is used by Wikipedia and most textbooks. So it be, it's basically saying A is equivalent to B, and then the mod N is emphasizing that we are using um, congru um, congruent modulo equivalency. Um, I don't like to type as much, you know, so I just you know, put a little subscript of N next to the equivalence you know, symbol to say that A and B are equivalent, but only when you look at uh, these two numbers in congruent modulo N you know, fashion. And this one is basically the definition. A is um, some kind of value, which is an integer, plus some kind of integer times N. And then B is also using the same value, which is the same integer, plus another constant you know, integer, KB, times N for some integers, K, K, KA and KB, and some integer V. So if this requirement is met, then we consider A and B to be congruent modulo um, N, okay, because you, know, you have to specify N. All right, so this is kind of the definition. So going to the next page. So we did, with all of these definitions, n is an integer that is at least 2. And then I gave you some examples. Um, let's reconsider our example. 3 is an 18R congruent modulo 16. That's because you know, three, if we set v as an integer to be 3, then 3 itself, which is a, is um, v plus ka times 16. So if I were to clarify myself, and I want to make sure that I understand all the components, then I would say this is A, this is V, this is um, KA, and this is N. So that's how we express you know, um, the, the value of A. And then on the other side, we have this is B and B, this is V again, this is KB, which is another constant integer, and this is n again. So you can see how um, the way we express 3 and 19 um, meets the requirement that we saw earlier 
when we talked about this conjunction here. This is, by the way, you know, the AND operator or conjunction operator. So that means, you know, in this case, you know, this requirement is met because A, which is 3, can be expressed as 3 plus 0 times 16. B, which is 19, can be expressed as 3 plus 1 times 16. And because you know, we can find V as an integer, we can find Ka as an integer to make this entire conjunction happen. That is why we call 3 and 19 congruent modulo 16. So that's basically the way we say it out in English. So there we go. And so as you can see, you know, reading this stuff here requires um, a little bit of knowledge check on your part to basically ask, okay, how does this work? Does it make sense? Do we know enough to you know, derive that? Or you know, this is an observation, or this is you know, something that tech you know, said is, is, is true, but is it really? Um, so that is why it is important. Okay, the next paragraph is really short, but it's also important as well. Sure, trying to interpret 0011 in base two as three or 19 is silly. Okay, right here. There's something not so silly about this. How do we know that three can be interpret can be represented as zero zero one one in base two? So now you have to go back to base conversion again because now you have to say, oh, okay, um, the least significant, you know. Um, oh, I did not know it can do this. I'm just hovering my pen over the tablet, and it shows you know, the location. That is really handy because I can use it as a pointer. Oh, nice. Okay. So we look at this one here. It is the least significant digit. It means, you know, this, we have this many of ones. Oh, uh, oh, I see. Okay. So we have this many of ones. We have this many of twos, this many of fours, and this many of eights. So when you add up, you know, one of one, one of two, none of four, none of eight, we do end up with a three. All right, so I hope you're getting the, the sense of, you know, how to read the module, because I don't just talk about the final product, okay? Because the final product is pretty easy. I can summarize this entire module in one, two, three, at the, at the most, you know, three equations. That's the, en that's the entire module. But what, what I really want to do is to explain why those equations work. You know what is behind. What is the math behind those equations? Um, I think that is really important in all of my classes. Some people disagree. Some people say that just tell me what I need to <clears throat> to pass the class. Okay. Mm, yeah, passing the class is not <laughs> is not that important. Well, okay, it is important, but it is not the only thing that is important because um, you. It's, I think it's important to build this you know, entire background knowledge and also the way to analyze um, your know, problems and understand um, technical you know, writing such as what you're reading right now because that is what you are going to do day in and day out as a software engineer or anyone working in the computer science field, in any field in computer science. So that's why it's kind of important. All right, so enough nagging, getting on to the next part. Negative integers. Okay, so I'm going to try that technique and just have, oh, nice, I like that. I did not know that until now. All right, so we call that A and B being uh, congruent modulo N is the same as saying blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah for some integer Ka and Kb and some integer v, such that you know, v is at least 0, but less than n. And there's no restriction of whether ka and kb can be negative. Now, that is important, OK, right here. ka and kb can be negative. So that means you know, we can now represent negative value. Or, I, OK, I take it back. So now we can say um, non-negative value and negative value can be congruent, modulo, whatever base we choose to use, okay? 
So this is really kind of cool because, uh, and then the next example illustrates exactly that. So the, ex the example you know, shows that for any base, a negative and non-negative value can be congruent modulo n. For example, using n equals to 16, uh, 3 and negative 29 are congruent modulo 16. And that's because you know, we already examined the 3, right? So 3 can be written as 3 plus 0 times 16. So I'm just going to label these things again. So this is A, this is B, this is our KA, and this is our N. But negative 29 can also be represented using the same template. But this time we call that B equals to V plus KB times N. And so as a result of this, as a result of being able to find the negative 2 and you know, the 3 to express negative 29, we can now say that 3 and 29 are congruent modulo 16. The 16 is basically you know, uh, what we choose to be n. All right, so this is really kind of important because this allows us to think, huh, so maybe we can use this kind of scheme in order to represent negative value because certain negative values and certain non-negative values, um, have, they, are module, they are congruent modulo whatever power of 2 we choose to use. In this case, we have 2 to the power 4 because we chose to use you know, only 4 bits. All right, so now we continue to read. Uh, negative 29 is too far on the negative side to be represented. This is because the multiplier to 16 is negative 2. So uh, what that means is you know, we, we still want to be able to distinguish um, one negative value from another negative value. So when if you think about this as a wheel, if we turn around the wheel more than once, then we, we can no longer really tell, you know, um, how should I put it? We, we, can, we cannot distinguish how many turns we have, how many times we have turned a wheel. We can look at you know, the positive side of the wheel or the negative side of the wheel or the left hand side versus the right hand side, but we cannot tell how many times we have turned around the entire thing. Um, so it then proceed to talk about if the multiply is just negative one, we can potentially use congruent modulus 16 to represent negative values. So what this you know, really kind of short table is trying to represent, the table, by the way, continues on the next page, is if we choose Ka to be zeros, then we can represent you know, A to be 0, 1, all the way up to 16. On the other hand, if we choose Kb to be negative 1, then B is negative 16 all the way to uh, negative 1. So that means you know, for every... Uh, v, there are multiple integers that are mo uh, congruent modulo 16. However, we choose the two that are the most important. In other words, in this case, we are saying that 0 and negative 16 are uh, congruent modulo 16. 1 and negative 15 are congruent modulo 16. And all the way, if you turn on to the next page, that 15 is modular congruent, uh, congruent modular, sorry, mo congruent modular 16 with negative 1. So this is important because it means that we can, um, we can selectively choose um, which value of v can be used for negative values and which v can be used for non-negative value. All right, so let's say that is the goal, okay? Let's say that the goal is we want to be able to represent both negative values and non-negative values. So I'm, I'm going to erase uh, these highlights because, you know, we are going to do something that is kind of important. So I'm erasing all of these. Come on, delete. And okay, I'm a little bit faster than what the tablet can do so it's it's having some problem it has it's having some lag okay i think this one has multiple highlights there we go and there's one more okay 
There we go. All right. So let's say that you know we want out of the 16 values here, we want one half of them to be uh, representing non-negative values, the other one half to be representing negative values. Okay, let's say that is the goal. Um, so now the question is, you know, which ones do you want to be representing um, non-negative values? And we need eight of them because 16 divided by two is eight. So the way this works out, okay, let me choose my actual hand-drawn, you know, um, highlighter here. So what we do is we end up using these eight as non-negative values. And I think it makes sense, right? You know, we want zero, the big pattern zero, which is zero, 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 zero to mean zero. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then the other ones, you know, we want to be representing, we want them to represent negative values. So that would be the bit pattern, you know, from here all the way to the next page, you know, with these over here. So we want those to be representing the negative value. So that means the negative values is going to range from negative one to negative eight. Um, this is, it, it makes sense, right? Because it'll be, do not want um, the representation of negative values to be lopsided because you know um, I mean I suppose in some cases you know you can make it totally lopsided but we want to be able to represent you know one half of all the possible values to be non-negative and one half of the uh, possible values to be negative and this is the way we choose that so the balance you know so I explained down here the balance is that for an int half the values are non-negative and the other half oops okay I just the and the other half are negative. In the examples of a 4-bit number, 0 to 7 are the non-negative values where Ka equals to 0, and negative 1 to negative 8 are the negative values where Kb equals to negative. Um, generally speaking, given a w-bit integer, which means it has w bits you know, as the bit width, the range of unsigned values is from zero to two to the power of two to the power of dub to zero. Sorry, zero to the power. Okay, zero to two to the power of w minus one, and then the range of int values is from negative two to the power of negative uh, to negative two time negative two to the power of w minus one to 2 to the power of w1, the whole thing minus 1. All right, so let me do a little bit of clarification here. The negation is applying to this entire thing um, because you know, normally your know, power to, to the power of uh, arithmetic negation has the highest priority, but in this case, um, you know, we basically raise 2 to the power of w minus 1 first, and then we negate the entire thing. All right, so right here, we have to stop, right? Because you know, um, it says you know right here um, in the next paragraph. Assume w is four, resulting n equals to two to the power of w equal to sixteen. But how about the range of the values, right? You know, so we have to plug that in. If w is four, then the most negative value that it can represent is um, based on this equation here. It's going to be two to the power of um, 4 minus 1, which is 3, which is 8, and then negate that. So that's negative 8. And then the most positive value it can represent is, you know, 8 minus 1, which is 7. So that means, you know, the range is, you know, basically from negative 8 to positive 7. So now we go back and ask, okay, is that consistent with the table that we just saw? So we can see, you know, this is negative 1, okay, going to negative 4, it is, you know, uh, you know, in increasingly negative and then we stop at negative 8 that is the most negative value for the non-negative value we started with 0 and then we move all the way to 7 so this confirms you know, um, what we what I claim you know, later on in here all right so next page uh, arithmetic negation in base 2 so in base 2 you know how do you uh, arith you know, what is arithmetic negation? Arithmetic negation is taking just the negation of something. I'll give you an example. Um, I can just write it here, okay? So that means you know, if I look at this as a 
as arithmetic negation. And to be very clear, okay, we can use an expression that we are negating that. So in this case, 3 plus 8 is negative 11. Okay, so this is 3 plus 8 is 11. And then we are negating 11, so we end up with a value of negative 11 here. That is arithmetic negation. Um, so now we look at arithmetic negation, and then we look at the following, when called following, which is you know, this equation here. This equation is always true. The reason why it is always true is you, all you have to do is to make k equal to 0. Then we have negative v being, um, you know, it's basically the same as negative v, but when k is non-zero, um, then it is uh, congruent modulo n as well, because that is the definition of congruent modulo n. So the validity of this particular equation is established because of the way um, congruent modulo is defined. And then what we do is um, we make k equal to 1, then in that case, you know, we can say that negative uh, v is congruent modulo n with negative v plus n, because you know, when k equals to 1, then we just end up with 1k. And note the change of the notation here. I was using congruent modulo here, and I changed it to a true equality over here. Because between this side and this side here, it is actually equivalence. They are actually equal in terms of value. So now, uh, all I do is I rewrite n plus 1, uh, excuse me, I rewrite this n as n plus 1, the whole thing plus 1. You go like, okay, that doesn't really do much. But wait, there's even some more here. Um, because I move the, uh, the negation of v into a subtraction of v inside this uh, particular uh, pair of parentheses, and then I move the plus one all the way out. In other words, I'm doing some really basic uh, algebraic, you know, manipulation in order to to basically say in the end um, we are. Okay, let me move the mouse pointer out of the way because I found a better way to point to things without using the mouse pointer. So in the end, what we are saying is negative v or or the negation of v, whatever value v is. Is, mod is congruent modulo with um, n minus 1 minus v, and then the whole thing plus 1 for any n. Okay? So to most people, this is, you know, a, you know, algebraic, you know, exercise. But what is the whole point? I mean, you know, what, what we had earlier was actually easy to read. I mean, look at this. Negative v plus n. That's a whole lot easier to read compared to n minus 1, the whole thing minus v again, and then that whole thing plus 1. So why do we do this? Um, this is significant because uh, when n is you know, 2 to the power of w, for some w that is greater than 0, assuming n equals to 2 to the power of w, then, um, then we end up with, uh, so this equation here, or this you know, uh, formula here, is the same as this formula here. The only thing I did was I changed this n to 2 to the power of w, because n is 2 to the power of w. That's the only thing that I changed. Um, it helps to use an example. When w equals to 4 and v equals to 3, then neg the negation of 3 is um, congruent modulo 16 with 16 minus 1, the whole thing minus 3, and then plus 1. So all I did was you know, really just to um, use concrete values instead of just the symbols. I'm going to do this right now, okay? you know, just, just so that you can see you know, what I mean by you know, changing those particular values. Um, all right, so what I did was uh, v is 3. Uh, 2 to the power of w is 16, 2 to the power of w is 16, and then uh, this v is 3. So that's all I did. You know, I was just using some concrete values here, and that's, you know, uh, to basically make an example. 
All right, so now what we do is we look at 16 minus 1, the whole thing, which is 13, uh, 15, and then the 15 minus 3. And so the question is, what does it look like? So this goes back to binary <laughs> number subtraction, which is in yet another module, because we want to look at this pattern here and go like, so what is special about this? So I'm going to do this part on the side, 1, 1, 1, 1, minus 0, 0, 1, 1. And this is in base 2. This is our x. This is our y. And I'm going to go through the whole thing. You know, this is q. This is t. And this is d. Okay. And in the binary subtraction, a uh, binary number subtraction module, we already talked about that q is just the exclusive or between the x and y. So one exclusive or with one is a 0. This is also 0. These are 1s. And then the carry, or the, uh, excuse me, this time it is the borrow. There's a zero here because you know, there are no um, more digits to the right-hand side. But then you look at one minus one, it does not have a borrow. You look at zero minus zero, it does not have a borrow. So this has a zero here. Zero, one minus one has no borrow. One, okay, why is it not showing? There we go. So we have 1 minus 1, there's no borrow. 0 minus 0 also has no borrow, so there's no borrow from the next digit. And then once we have here, then we have 1 minus 0 has no borrow. 1 minus 0 has no borrow, so we have no borrow here. 1 minus 0 has no borrow. 1 minus 0 has, oops, 1, come on. 1 minus 0 has no borrow, so we end up with no borrow here. And then D is also the R between the Q and the T, which is also, once again, exclusive OR. So we have 0 here, 0 here, 1 here, 1 here. All right, so what is important about this observation is the entire row of T are zeros. Okay, so that's mm, kind of important. But what is even more important is um, whatever Y is here, this, whatever D has you know, at the same digit, is basically just the negation of that. The reason why this works is because uh, when we have one exclusive or with something, <coughs> it becomes the negation of that something. Okay, let me say that one more time. One, <coughs> excuse me, exclusive or with some bit u is basically the same thing as the negation of you. How do we prove this? Okay, I just made a claim, and you know that claim was uh, later on mentioned in, <coughs> excuse me, in the module. In fact, for each digit in this specific case, when x of i equals to one, q of i is x of i exclusive with y of i, but because all the i's are ones, so we have one exclusive or with y of i. <coughs> excuse me which is the negation of y of i. That is a claim. And then on the next page, it you know, actually shows you why it works. And since you know, t of i equals to 0, none of them would end up with um, a borrow in any sense, then you, know, you can prove that for any Boolean value, k exclusive or with 0 is k, and k exclusive or with 1 is the negation of k, and so on. So basically, what we end up with is D, the entire D is the bitwise knot of Y. And the bitwise knot operator is called the tilde symbol. It is a C++ operator. Um, this should have been taught in CISB 360, but I do understand that a lot of professors do not teach the bitwise knot operator. But the bitwise knot operator is exactly just that, okay? So if we say that, you know, um, um, okay, in this case, we have you know, d equals to the bitwise knot of y. That means d of whatever digit i is the negation of y of the same digit. Every bit at that position is the negation of each other. Okay, that sounds really uh, confusing. Okay, let me make it more clear. Every digit i of d is the negation of the same digit at the same position, the digit at the same position of y. 
that is what I meant to say. <coughs> All right, and you know, and then in the next paragraph, I said you should verify this observation and write some code in C++ or use a debugger to confirm. So the question is, how do you do that, right? Um, if you already know how to use GDB or online GDB, you know, this is pretty easy to do. Uh, you can also just your custom write some code to do it. And the way you do that is to um, use variables of a certain uh, bit width, you know, let's say a char with only eight bit characters, and then you give it a value, and then you apply the tilde symbol, and then you print it out again as an integer, and then you verify that you know, once you perform the tilde operation, um, the underlying binary representation is the bitwise not of the other one. Yes, I just said a whole bunch of things that you might need to listen to again. So pause right now and then just go back a few, like 20 seconds or so, and listen to that again. Um, it is important to write that code to verify, to confirm it, because the confirmation and writing this code is helping you to build additional pathways in your mind to connect the concepts. And if you don't do that, if you just say, oh, text says you know, this is true, so it must be true, so I'm not going to waste my time to do it, then you're missing another opportunity to make connections between the concepts. I know it may sound like a waste of time because you know, now you have to kind of you know, pause the video and then go use a debugger or try to figure it out because you have never used a debugger or have to figure out, okay, how do I write C code and just use your C out or something like that to double check this. It will take some time and it will take you some time to realize that chars are actually signed and it will give you some problems if you are to you know, just kind of uh, you know, print out the uh, bitwise not of something because it will print out as a, as a character and you know, which is not the intention. The intention is to look at the binary code. <clears throat> but having said that, um, it's kind of important to kind of go through the exercise. Now, if you get to a certain point where of, you know, okay, I really cannot figure this out, then what do you do? Well, this is what I would do, or this is what I would suggest you to do, is to basically say, you know, write in your notes here, okay, um, this particular tool is really helpful because it allows me to uh, write down some notes, you know, like annotation. So what I'm going to do is to use this tool here um, and then just kind of highlight, you know, the part that I need to highlight. And then I'm going to leave a note, oh, okay, leave a note to myself right here. And, okay, um, there's a way to type this. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to write a note to myself and go like, uh, can not figure out how need to ask tech in class. <clears throat> All right, cannot figure out how need to ask tech in class. There we go. So this is the one that I want. All right and save there we go now obviously you don't need a fancy you know tablet to do this you can do this on a piece of paper or in your notes okay uh, but it's important okay all of these are a part of the learning process that i'm intending in this class okay it is optional but this is part of the intention anyhow continuing um now we plug this into the original congruent module and statement. And then right here, um, we have negative, the negation of V is now um, congruent modulo two to the power of N, blah, 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 which is the same thing here. But because of the early observation, um, I'm gonna use a highlighter tool this time, this one, okay? But because of the uh, thought exercise earlier, we can now take this part, oh, actually I need to include that too. That entire part is now just simplified to be tilde V, which is the bitwise knot of V. And this is called the two's complement because one's complement is uh, just you know, tilde X, and then two's complement is the entire thing. 
So C1 is, okay, so let me go back to this tool. So C1 is representing your one's complement, which is just bitwise not the tilde operator. And C2 is representing C1 plus one, because you know, this whole thing here is just C1, and two's complement is you know, uh, one's complement plus one. That is how two's complement is defined. So since this is a definition, okay, it is important. So if you have a fancy tool you know, you know, that allows you to kind of mark this you know, as something that is important, you know, I would do that. But I'm going to do something a little bit different here. So I would put this in my own note. Okay, This is my notes here. So I'm just going to put you know, this in my own notes here, leave a certain section here, and say two's complement of x is one's complement, uh, one's complement of x plus 1. Okay, and this is 2 the x plus 1. And I'll just even remind myself that this is bitwise not. Okay. <coughs> so this is important because you know, uh, this gives me a place to look for all the definitions related to a particular module. So 2's complement is Im important because it is a way to perform arithmetic negation using bitwise not and the addition of one. So we're going to check out two examples. So when I say two examples, I'm, um, I'm the first one is you know, given the value of three, which is represented by zero zero one one. What is the negation of three? So now the negation of three is the same as the two's complement of the bitwise representation of three which is then the one's complement of the bitwise notation of 3 plus 1. The bitwise notation, the one's complement of the bitwise, no, uh, the binary representation of 3 is 0, 0, 1, 1. So the bitwise not of that is 1, 1, 0, 0. When we add 1 to it, it becomes 1, 1, 0, 1. So I'm claiming that 1, 1, 0, 1 is representing negative 3. And it says right here, this is consistent with the table that we have. So what are you going to do when I make that claim? Do you just say, well, since tax says you know, this is consistent with the table that we had earlier, I'm just going to take it for granted. Yes, you can do that and save yourself some time. But you're missing yet another opportunity to have the concepts to connect. So I would not do that. Okay, I would actually just kind of go back, look at the table, look at, you know, 1101 what value it is supposed to be representing okay so you look you work it out one one zero one we have one of one none of two one of four and one of eight so when you add up eight four and one you have 13. so that means that we are looking at the value of 13 <clears throat> and you know the highlighting already suggests that this is the negative side of the value being represented in fact the value being represented is negative three so this is important because this is confirming um, what we are doing. Okay, come on, scroll, scroll. All right, so this is confirming what we are doing here is indeed, you know, the two's complement operation is the same as arithmetic negation, but it only works when you're dealing with congruent modulo some power of uh, two, and you are looking at everything in a binary representation. But it does work, okay? So the conclusion here is also important. The negation of negative three is three. So this one is basically just saying, okay, if you apply all of these operations, you should get it back. But it confirms one really important thing, which is, oh, so two's complement does seem to do the same thing as normal arithmetic negation. And you know, instead of just kind of glancing through this part here and go like, okay, tack this on derivation, blah, 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 and got back, you know, zero, zero, one, one, I would highly encourage you <clears throat> to perform the actual operation yourself because that gives you a chance to exercise, to practice, you know, the application of two's complement and which is defined you know, in you know, one's complement and then the plus one and so on. And, you know, Getting the hands-on, you know, confirmation, verification of the material is super important. 
because you know, every single time you do this on a piece of paper on your own, you are building additional connections. Or you might be noticing that, oh, wait, hold on a second here. I'm not really sure what C1 is. Then you have to go back and find out what C1 really is. Um, and that was defined a little bit earlier. This is where C1 is defined. Um, and this is why you don't see me putting all the definitions in one single spot in my notes. Because the way I write my notes is in um, is focusing on the explanation of how one thing connects to the other one, rather than, oh, this is a whole bunch of definitions, just memorize these definitions, and that's all you need to do. Nope, because that is not all you need to do. All you, what you, the most important part is not so much the equations themselves, but I think the most important part is the derivation, the rationale behind the derivation of the equations. That is the most important part. So the last uh, section of this particular module is really kind of funny in a way uh, because it says you know, it asks the question of is 1101 in parentheses 2 which means as a binary bit pattern <coughs> in base 2 is it really 13 or is it negative 3 the answer is the gentle answer the nice answer is it depends um, but the kind of more blunt answer is what is it to you why do you need to know? Because most of the time, you actually do not need to know what 1101 is representing. Because, you know, this, I think, um, you know, if you read this particular paragraph here, it says that you know, 1101 can be representing um, whether a pixel should be uh, dark or light. You know, it can be representing a lot of things. Okay, so it's not just limited to 13 versus negative 3. 1101 can be representing a lot of different things. So we don't need to know. We don't need to know until it matters. So when does it matter? When you're comparing. So when it compares, then whether 1101 is 13 or negative 3 becomes important because 13 is greater than 0, but negative 3 is less than 0. So, but before we do any, before we get to comparison, what, you know, what 1101 is really representing, we don't care. We just need to know that 13 and negative 3 have the same representation as a 4-bit number as 1101. That's all we need to know. That is the concept of congruent modulo, in this case 16, is different values can have the same representation. Okay, um, and that concludes you know, this particular module, and I have no idea how long I have used in this presentation, but that's kind of the um, kind of what I've wanted to show people. It's not on one hand, it is me you know kind of teaching this particular section, uh, not section, this teaching this particular module, but I think I'm also trying to focus on how to read the module, and you know how to spend your time you know when you're reading the module uh, both before the class and after the class okay and how you you want to take notes and so on now obviously I'm not taking a whole lot of notes here you know because I I know all this stuff already after I wrote this stuff <coughs> but the point is you know um, there were multiple people asking me you know why don't I just put all the definitions in one spot to save you the time of putting the definition in your notes at one particular spot the reason is I never thought about I'm not the way I think about all this stuff is not definition centric it is reasoning centric which means how I go from one sentence to the next is important how I make the connections you know, between all the different parts is important the rationale is important the derivation is important the actual you know, definitions the actual equations the actual formulae is nothing more than a byproduct of all of those other steps and you might be thinking that this is a waste of time because you know I could have summarized this entire thing you know with you know, a few definitions and a few equations um, It is not to me. It if it if I th thought it was a waste of time, I wouldn't have done it this way. Okay, because you know, it took me time to write out all of these rationale as well. 
But I think the rationale is important because that knowing how to think is much more important than what to know, than knowing things. Um, because when you are going to be hired as a software engineer or as someone working in the computer science field, by the time that you're looking for a job, I can assure you all of those jobs require you to know how to think. They don't necessarily care as much about what you already know, but they need to know that you can outthink AIs. Because you know, for things that only require knowledge and the typical application of knowledge, they can be done by AI already by the time you're looking for jobs. So this is also why, now I started doing this way before AI became you know, prevalent, but I think it's even more important now than ever that you know, the reasoning, you know, how you reason things out you know, is becoming more and more important. All right, I think I've emphasized that point quite a few times already, and you're probably getting sick and tired of it. So I'm going to stop the recording now, and you can return to your normal weekend activities. Thank you for watching.